I used to play with a dollhouse. Now I just watch people make them on TikTok. But dollhouses are having a moment. Barbie's having an existential crisis in one, Taylor Swift's burning hers down, and I, I guess children are playing with them. But many of the earliest beautiful miniature houses were not designed for kids to play with. They were historical artifacts in the making produced by very wealthy people. So today we're going through the past 500 did you hear my shoulders? Ooh. So today we're going through the past 500 years of dollhouses to figure out the dollhouses for show and the ones for play and how we went from gilded dressers with tiny chandeliers to pink plastic mini McMansions. How many things have you seen made in the year 1558? Well, if you haven't yet, it's not starting now. This doesn't exist anymore. But it was originally commissioned for Albrecht V, the Duke of Bavaria. Lucky for us, there was a royal inventorian, a real job you can simulate in Minecraft. He went to town cataloging these miniatures. There was a stable, a wine cellar, a bathroom, a kitchen, a courtyard, an orchard, sleeping chambers, a sewing room with looms, a chapel and a ballroom with the duke and duchess surrounded by six servants. Now this dollhouse sounds great and it made it just over a hundred years before it pulled a Katniss and burned down along with the rest of the mansion it was in. So we might not have an example of a miniature house from 1550, but there are some from negative 1750 or 1700 BCE. It might not be a dollhouse exactly, but it's certainly a miniature building that was excavated and stolen from a burial ground in Egypt and now somehow finds itself at the Met in New York City. These miniatures were not taken from the graves themselves, but instead a layer above. There's something similar you might still see today in different cultures, like these miniature buildings on headstones in Yucatan, Mexico. All the graves close together makes it feel like a small town of little churches and homes. In an attempt to organize our dollhouses, we will be tallying all the dollhouses we talk about from here on out as either document or play document represented by this tiny little book in Queen Mary's dollhouse and play by this doll that looks like it's been through it. 1600s! One of the oldest dollhouses to exist is the Stromer dollhouse with six rooms above and eight below dated 1639. And you'll notice there's a balustrade which might seem like a generous thing for your dolls so they don't take a tumble in the middle of the night when they walk around on their own but it's a much more architectural answer. At that time in Nuremberg, it was common to see open gallerias, especially in courtyards, which had nearly identical balustrades. But similar to an episode of Upstairs Downstairs, we aren't just seeing the rooms of the wealthy elite on top, we are seeing the whole mechanism for how the house runs below, which includes a stable with a cow, wine and preserves, laundry, a linen closet, a fire for cooking. And it probably wasn't being used for play, it would have been a document. Document. And although it's a bit too fancy for play, it might have been sold as a teaching device. Before this house was built, an older single non-wealthy woman, Anna Kofferlin, had made it her mission to build a miniature house. She succeeded and then she treated it as an exhibit to the public, getting admission in exchange for seeing the miniature house. And in her advertising pamphlet, she pitched the dollhouse as a learning device. Therefore, dear children, look you well at everything, how well it is arranged. It shall be a good lesson to you. So when in time to come you have your own home and God willing your own hearth, you will for all your life put things nicely and properly as they should be in your own households. We do model our decor off of our dollhouses, hence why every apartment I've lived in has a slide going from the top floor to the bottom floor. But what Anna had provided was a reason for such an expensive, elaborate, adorable item. And the idea of dollhouses for education grew in popularity as much as dollhouses did. And there are slightly more modest examples, like this dollhouse, also from Nuremberg, 35 years after the Stromer dollhouse. This one's from an artisan's family. The whole house can be closed up, showing little windows and then open like a double door to find four rooms, a bedroom, nursery, dining room, and kitchen. And like a Where's Waldo for Protestantism, can you find Martin Luther on this house? There he is, plastered on the nursery. What can you say? That guy likes getting his prints stuck to the door. And just to further prove that childcare still has a lot of similarities, look at this miniature baby walker which lets our toddler doll be on the move. I do feel she might be safer in the house with the balustrades. But to me that baby walker helps prove that this is a toy. Designed possibly as a teaching lesson, but once you start sticking celebs on your walls, I mean priests, you've kind of entered the play category. And now prepare for a house that is such a 3D document that it was also turned into a 2D document. 
This is the dollhouse of Petronella Ortman. She was a Dutch woman who was widowed young, making her wealthy, and then married a man her own age who was also wealthy. At the start of her second marriage, she began working on a dollhouse and she was perfecting it for 25 years. The nine rooms are very formal with perfect wood details, bed canopies, and cabinet work. And in 1710, when she finished her dollhouse, it was memorialized in a painting. And although all the illustrated rooms match their real life tiny life counterpart, the painting feels like it belongs in the Surrealist movement. Each room doesn't look like a doll's room, but instead a complete scene. And seeing them all together gives this creeping perspective, like seeing a whole house living at once. And all those dolls that look so real in the painting aren't around anymore, with the exception of a baby doll. But the house still lives on, as does the painting, in the same exhibit in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, making this a clear document because it's a document that was documented. 1700s. Have you ever been trying to figure out how to decorate your apartment or your house so you boot up The Sims so you can plan out the best place to put your dresser? Well, The Sims is a pretty good deal when you compare it to building a miniature of the house that you're in the process of building in 1730 England. Has that not happened to you guys? Susanna Wynn was the wife of a textile merchant who had aspirations for politics. They were in the process of building a large estate called Nostel Priory. It was this miniature that was created to help her design the space and the sliding doors uncover her vision. She didn't live long enough to see that original vision realized, dying at 31, before the house project was completed. And with her, the plans for the house were only partially realized. Now this miniature house lives within the big house it was meant to mirror. But in the past 300 years, things have changed many times over making this a document of things that almost happened. But not every dollhouse looks that elaborate. Expensive dollhouses might have been imported into the colonies by very wealthy families, but the earliest surviving example of an American dollhouse is much more charming. Currently in the Van Cortlandt House Museum in the Bronx, this four-room dollhouse has two sides and looks sturdy and sweet. None of the furniture is original, but you can still see the fireplace and the shelf details. To me, it looks like a house to be played with because of the drawer below where you could store all your dolls and the absolute mess you've made. We don't know anything about the furniture this dollhouse might have originally had. It could have been local or imported from one of those big toy manufacturing cities like Nuremberg. A 1799 Bestelmeyer catalog shows how much tiny furniture was available, including miniature cabinets, storefronts, couches, and chandeliers. The 1800s. In the 1800s, after going to a play, you might want to experience it again, but worse. So in London, for one or two pence, you could memorialize your visit with a toy theater. It was a paper kit where you could assemble the stage, the actors, the scenery, and the costumes. And with the provided abridged script, you could recreate the play for yourself and your friends. The opportunities with paper were increasing as printing techniques were improving. In 1811, a German inventor built this steam-powered printing press, increasing the printing speed by 10 times. The more innovations that came in printing meant more paper opportunities for the Victorian-era paper dolls. And I guess for like books and stuff. This meant the creation of handbooks with not only paper dolls, but also paper furniture, which could be cut, folded, and pasted, and played with. By children. And although paper dolls were a place for more affordable play, that doesn't mean that large wooden doll houses were left behind. They could be bought in catalogs or be built by talented family members, like this one that lives in the Wenham Museum in Massachusetts. In 1884, a Salem silversmith built this dollhouse for his two daughters. It's showing its period with the cupola on the roof and the detailed bay windows on the sides. But unlike most Victorian roofs, this one hinges open like a jaw. Grateful that doesn't occur in real life. But being a silversmith, he went above and beyond, not just outside, but also on the inside with the silver tea set, birdhouses, stroller, and the chandeliers with what looks like pearls as the light source. And this is one of the rare houses I'm gonna put in both document and play because it was gifted for play. But my God, was this place about the details. And all these personally made dollhouse pieces feel really rare because of how international the dollhouse furniture game was. Importing from London or Germany was common. And you can watch how industrialization increased output for these goods. But just like automation today, 
it didn't change that there were human hands making these pieces. In 1852, a miniature copper kettle maker was interviewed. He was making nearly 5,000 copper kettles a year, which could hold water and be boiled. But 25 years later, in 1877, this was said of a pewter tea set maker. 23 separate articles make up a set, and of these, two and a half million are made yearly by one house alone. One girl can make 2,500 small teacups in a day. A day! And that just continued in the 1900s, with magazine ads and catalogs like Sears and department stores and FAO Schwartz selling dollhouses and everything that can go inside of them. The 1900s. Before World War I, only 25% of toys bought in the US were made in the US. But after the war, that number was 90%. And these American dollhouse companies were matching the eclectic architectural styles booming throughout North America. A stick style dollhouse with a keyhole arch from a Rhode Island company? Sure. A tiny bungalow made in Massachusetts? Of course. A mini Spanish villa made in Illinois? Okay. They were made of paper or early plywood and they were built and bought to be played with. As I've been working on this video, I keep thinking there will be a time when dollhouses are out of style. And although the fashions might change, kids are pretty consistently playing with dollhouses. And for many of the women who devoted themselves to crafting these document dollhouses, it's not a fad for them either. There is constant creation. But one of the times that I noticed a lot of renewed interest was in the 1920s. There was Catherine Mansfield's short story focused on class divides and a little lamp and an expensive dollhouse. And in 1924, a dollhouse was gifted to Queen Mary. Craftspeople created everything in miniature. The tiny library was filled with new miniature stories written by royalist writers of the time, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Aldous Huxley, Rudyard Kipling. The entire dollhouse had running water, flushable toilets, and the tiniest toilet paper. Keep in mind, this was only five years after toilets were legally required in new construction in the UK. This one is the epitome of a document, considering it's been on display most of its life. But around the same time, another dollhouse was being created, but instead of a team of artists, it was one singular vision. If you wanna see the most flapper dollhouse activity, take a look at this painting, Portrait of My Sister Carrie Stettheimer from 1923. There is Carrie holding a miniature chair in front of her large columned dollhouse. In the background, a group having dinner. Are they dolls? Are they humans? I don't know. Carrie was one of three very creative sisters. Carrie was the dollhouse maker, Florine was the painter, and the youngest was Eddie, the writer. Together they hosted successful salons in the city, and in the summer they rented mansions to host their events. Their artists and writers hung out, which means that Carrie's dolls have excellent artwork in the ballroom. What I love most about this dollhouse is how it's a clear depiction of its time. You can feel the 1920s oozing off of this house, in the bobs on the painted dolls, on the cellophane curtains, in the shimmering furniture. For a time often written about, this encapsulation of the roaring 20s feels especially alive. And this house makes me question my criteria of document versus play, because these countless adult women and men who created these dollhouses were doing it as a form of creation. When I'm building a house in The Sims, I might be trying to accurately depict a specific style, but I'm still playing The Sims. These people were pouring their creativity into something that created the same magic you felt when you were a kid and you saw a tiny house with a tiny doll holding a tiny teacup. I wouldn't know about all of these doll houses if this woman, Flora Gill Jacobs, hadn't had that magical experience with her neighbor's dollhouse as a child. Then as an adult, she built a collection that would turn into a museum, that would turn into a book in 1958 that I've been referencing constantly. And she did the true documentation, writing down the details of houses, tracking down their stories, getting their photographs. And because they have to be stories that are track downable, you end up with a lot more dollhouses that fit the document category. Houses that were preserved because they were made by a wealthy person whose means allowed them a safe place to get old until a museum might be interested in them. So for all these document dollhouses, there are millions of dollhouses that were played with intensely by kids, passed from generation to generation, completely redecorated, left behind, donated, thrown away. 
And the doll houses that we play with have a story that more closely follows real houses. Dolls move in, dolls move out, all the furniture gets taken out, new furniture comes in, it gets abandoned. And so much of that history is rarely documented. Like in February, when a college student who volunteers at a university museum posted a TikTok of the small paper dollhouse furniture that was printed on the backside of butter packaging. And I looked for more information or examples of paper printing, packaging, dollhouse furniture, all of those things, but it's not documented anywhere. But that's because all those little weird parts of life are rarely memorialized. Flora Gill Jacobs can't take us much further in the 20th century, so we're gonna do this together. And since there will be pink in our future, I think this requires an outfit change. Tin dollhouses became popular in the 50s and 60s. They had the constructability and the printing flexibility of paper, but were much sturdier. A lot of the dollhouses from this time feel like they're matching the real life neo-colonial and ranch style houses that were really popular. So here is a dollhouse with a garage. How does the doll feel about the impending shift to the suburbs and the death of the walkable city? She's just a doll, she doesn't know. Plastic furniture had entered the scene in the 40s, but starting in the mid 60s, we're seeing dollhouses made of plastic, like Barbie and Skipper's deluxe dream house. And this one leans into the perks of plastic. It's light and sturdy. So now this dollhouse is ready for the child on the go who has business to attend to or divorced parents. But Barbie also altered the size of the dollhouse scene. Previously, most dolls who resided in a dollhouse were between five and six inches, but Barbie is nearly a foot. And this explains why when you put your Barbie in your regular dollhouse, it really has King Kong energy. And that's because most of the dollhouses we've talked about so far are on the 1 12th scale, meaning one inch is equivalent to 12 inches a foot. So if this bed is two feet off the ground, that means it's two inches high in a dollhouse. Oh my God, am I in a dollhouse? Get me out of this dollhouse, please. Let me out of the dollhouse. Now Barbie added an additional scale. So six inches in real life is the equivalent to one inch in Barbie universe, which makes Margot Robbie 11 inches tall. But what made Barbie feel like a real game changer in the dollhouse universe was all the little innovations, like the elevator that you could move up and down. In 1974, they introduced her townhouse, which had a movable elevator, but that feature is still the talk of the town when I was growing up. In the dollhouses we talked about, there were rarely stairs, and if they were, they were more a set piece, not something you were using all the time. But here is this fancy elevator that moves and it feels expensive and magical. I even saw it come up multiple times when I asked you guys about the dollhouses you remember from your childhood. But that's the thing that's so amazing about these nostalgia memories. I had a wooden dollhouse that my mom painted for me and I had little wire dolls and I loved it. But I also remember going to my friends to play with her sisters Barbie magical motorhome, prepping me for a life on the road. And I still somehow remember the bubbling sound that the sync button made. And since 1977, Barbie had fully transferred over to the pink universe, but that decision was made mostly so that they could own a color and stand out better in the toy aisle. But it also helped add to this like mystical quality that Barbies had. I had never seen a place so pink in my life. Previously, dollhouses seemed to be trying to match reality, but these looked like a dream world with colors I had never considered combinable. What if we put hot pink with light pink and purple? That's brilliant. And it makes me think of the original intention of a dollhouse, this idea of practicing for real life, learning how a house ran so you could be a better housewife in the future. And it might be because I've had boy genius stuck in my head the whole time I've been writing this, but I keep thinking of the line, always an angel, never a god. And that's my takeaway of dollhouses. The plan was to create an angel, assisting in making a house run smoothly. But you're not trying to make a doll's life smooth. You imagine their stories, you create their world. You're not an angel, you are a god. When I stopped playing with Barbies and dolls, very late, mind you, I moved on to the virtual dollhouse space, like The Sims, which gives you all the fun of a dollhouse and all the godly control over a world. But in a world with no computers, where it's not so easy to make this virtual dollhouse world, I could easily envision myself making a very classy, slightly gothic Victorian 
dollhouse. Now I mentioned your comments and the thing that was most interesting was how varied all of the dollhouses you all played with were. You were playing with the Fisher Price dollhouse, a Winnie the Pooh treehouse, um, actual Victorian paper dollhouse, Briar Howard Stables, the Barbie Grand Hotel, that one was sick, Vero Puppin House, Barbie Magic Key House, the Polly Pocket where she changed clothes, other just little Polly Pockets, the My Scene Party Pad, the Bratz foldable ones, or ones that your granddad or your mom or your cousin made you. But the main point is it's varied. And right now the Barbie movie, which I'm really excited about, is working overtime to tell us that the Barbie dream house was the dollhouse to come out in the past 60 years. But we all have our own independent memories of the dollhouses we used to play with. And right now, as people are in the process of creating a document for the past, you should document yours if you still can. Your past or your present or what your kids are playing with. Take photos of the dollhouses you loved, add them to Wikipedia, post them online or on forums so that we can have more toys and dollhouses being memorialized that looked like the stuff people were actually playing with. By the way, you're all invited to my internet house, which might be a dollhouse. We talk about houses and architecture and history here, and all you have to do to be invited in is subscribe. If you like this video, leave me a comment and tell me so that I can know that I'm making the types of videos that you guys want to see. If you like this video, I also recently uploaded a video about Emily Gilmore, and there are some dollhouse comparisons, so maybe you'll like that. Special thank you to Samantha Grantham from the Wenham Museum, who actually took photos for me of that Salem Silversmith dollhouse. That was really cool. Thank you so much. If you're in New England, you should definitely visit that museum. It has a ton of toys and dollhouses. Bye.